Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks, his website, rickackerman.com. He's speaking to us from Summers Point, New Jersey. That sounds like a nice place, Rick. Fabulous place. Uh, It's almost like having a beautiful view of Central Park uh, with prices from the west side, not the east side. You know, we're right on the bay here. And if you're across the bay in Margate, Ventnor, Longport, it's very expensive to look at the bay but here in summer's point still a bargain right and uh, we're getting a little bit of that uh, summer points breeze on, on your microphone there so oh okay let yeah. let me okay I, I got you hang on i've got a state-of-the-art microphone that only picks up ambient noise and ignores <laughs> my voice <laughs> now rick we're looking at the official inflation numbers which of course are a month behind in canada They've got inflation under 3%. The U.S. officially is under 4 It's 3 point something. Are the central banks going to ignore the fact that they're nearly down to their 2% target and keep on hiking rates? Yeah, they definitely will. And, and I can say that more from a technical standpoint with confidence than just kind of guessing about it. Uh, in this week's uh, commentary, I put out a chart that shows interest on the 10-year currently around uh, 3.79, or that's where it was when I uh, wrote this up, and headed, though, for 5.5%. That's where they're going. And um, if the uh, 10-year is going to 55 there's no way we're going to have an asset deflation, the, the one I've been predicting for ever, uh, anytime soon. So uh, I see more inflation, higher rates, and I don't think that the nominally lower rates that we're getting now uh, represent anything even close to victory uh, over inflation. But we'll keep seeing CPI inflation until the, the big the, the big mama, the, the deflation that's been waiting for 30 years to happen, happens. Mm. Now, what will be the first sign that... Uh inflation has been wrestled to the ground or is this stagflation are we already seeing that we had that in the 70s and 80s where uh wages weren't going up but prices definitely were well i don't think we're going to get to see it as a process so much as uh, see it in a way that we wake up one morning and we discover that we're in a barter economy where people are thinking more about uh, surviving where their next meal is going to come from rather than return on investment. So, um, you know, I don't think you can take a step back and sort of look at things. They're too complicated to analyze. Um, But certain things are, I think, uh, inevitable, and one of them is a deflationary bust that uh, will probably originate in the real estate sector. But there are so many other dominoes waiting to topple, starting with, let's say, the state of illinois pension system so we're going to have a massive episode of zeros getting wiped off the books and it's going to happen precipitously now the reason we take a look at illinois their finances are so bad that uh several years ago if you won on the state lottery if it was more than a couple of grand they gave you an iou for that million dollar win (laughs) Right, yeah, I, and I predict someday Illinois Illinois will be the first state to print its own script. And, um, uh, you know, there are two dozen other states that are not in much better shape than Illinois, but Illinois is the most profligate of the, the, uh, the, the fiscal entities that pass for states in the 50 states. And um, 
So they're going to go first, and, and when they go hat in hand to the government, and I always suggest substituting the word taxpayers for government, when they go to taxpayers wanting to be bailed out, those other two dozen states are going to be right in line saying, where's ours? So um, as I mentioned before, you, you can't monetize the coming pension system bust that, that, that for all we know is probably still based on 8% annual returns. So um, uh, it's, apart from keeping asset values pumped, that's what the Fed does best. It's a whole whole nother thing to be able to, to, to have to send out checks for 500 to $3,000 a month to reti- Illinois uh, former you know, retired workers. That's, that's real inflation. And, and you can't get too far, very far with it before people realize that it's unsustainable. And that's when you, again, collapse into your deflationary spiral. So the feds at cross purposes here also, uh, the reason I say that, the higher they hike interest rates, the more expensive things come. Isn't that what inflation is? Things are more expensive. Mm, you got two things sort yeah. of in opposition there. Yeah. The, the hike on interest rates is, is um, implicitly weighing on asset values, particularly real estate. So they aren't really things in op- they're, they're things in opposition rather than work together. So the higher interest rates, um, they do reflect um, inflation. You know, uh, certain uh, things that are present in inflation. But uh, ultimately, they reprice debt so that so that you get a deflationary outcome. And and another thing I want to mention is that it's really it's really it's not the nominal rates that matter. Uh, the, whatever the rate is, even a mortgage rate, uh, since everything is uh, leveraged up to the eyeballs. It's the asset values or the collateral value that matters, and and the the real rate of inflation is important. And we found that out in a very difficult way in 2007, 2008, into 2009, um, that if you have a, a nominally low mortgage rate, let's say 4 or 5%, which these days is looking low, if your home is decreasing in value by 10% a year, you've got a real problem. So so I wouldn't be too concerned about nominal rates. It's really the uh, the collateral base of assets that supports all that borrowing that matters. Now, my littlest sister is the co-manager of a co-op in a little town called Peace River, which is 300 miles, 500 Ks north of Edmonton. So it's way up in northern Alberta. And she has seen an interesting phenomena at the store. People are paying in cash in older bills, bills printed back in the 70s and 60s. They're dipping into their secret stash of cash to pay bills because they don't have any other money. Hard economic times are here, and this is one of the first signs. She also pointed out in the 2008 recession, she couldn't get a tow truck because they were so busy repossessing motorhomes and high-end SUVs. And, they, of course, they get a 15% commission on the price of that repossessed motorhome. So, yeah, they're making 15, 20 grand instead of 100 bucks on the tow for her car. These are interesting signs uh, of bad times. That's that's really interesting, you know. Could be, uh, I'm always telling my subscribers to keep a shoebox of fives, tens, twenties, fifties, and hundreds for that day that's coming where we're in a barter barter situation. Uh, but but I can't imagine what uh, what it would take for for me, let's say, to start pulling out my shoebox money. Um, the digital economy is still functioning pretty pretty well, and you know you hear all this stuff about the government or they the cat that's with a capital T are going to implement their own electronic money system, but that's a lot of baloney really. Um, you, you know the idea is that every transaction will be trackable, but that's the case now. We already have that. We have a digital money system. It's called credit cards, and nobody nobody uses cash anymore except for your. Uh, your kin there in, in, uh, in very northern Canada. So I'm not sure whether that's a harbinger of things that are, are going to drift south, but um, 
you know, we're, we're going to have to see a pretty, pretty nasty, well, I would say a decline in, in the stock market before people start feeling a little bit pressed. Mm-hmm. But again, the average person is barely involved in the stock market. Only people who understand how the market works, something like only 10%. The rest is big time money. Well, but you know, it's still the stock market yeah. still winds up being very important as a psychological buttress of mm-hmm. insanity, uh, the, the insanity that we we have that, that, that sort of defines our system. And uh, because even if you're not actively trading the markets or you don't have investments, um, most people are aware that the stock market is not collapsing. That it really is, uh, you know, for months and months and months, it's been headed. Uh, up, 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 even possibly to new all-time highs. So if people are aware of that in the, in the backs of their minds, it kind of it wards off all the, uh, the, the, the negative thoughts, the scary thoughts about, you know, what's going to happen to the economy. So, uh, so I think that even just a, a kind of uh, a, a tangential uh, awareness uh, of the stock market is a very key psychological uh, crutch right now. And, and as alternative currencies go, we go all digital. Already, organized crime is using Pokemon cards as currency. There's limitations on how much cash you can take across the border, but you can take as many Pokemon cards as you like. Oh, no, I, I can see that. Uh, that's not going to come to any good good end. Um, I wonder, my kids uh, disgorged all their Pokemon cards, and I used to tell them there's no way that something that's sold as a collectible will ever be, become collectible or worth anything, but but I, I was wrong about that because uh, everybody got so tired of Pokemon that they, they disposed of their cards, probably burned them. <laughs> So, uh, well, it's, it's nice that the mafia is tuned in on that. Yeah. Uh, I also had a collection, a complete set of NFL cards in 1972. I think that's the year the Dolphins went undefeated. Uh, my mom uh-huh. threw it out. Do you know what that would be worth today? I yeah, don't even want to think. Mom, all our moms did that. You know, I had, did. I had the whole top series, tops baseball cards, yeah. uh, virtually complete from about 1955 on. You know, with the, obviously the Mickey Mantle cards and the Hank Aaron rookie cards and all that, but um, uh, it, it all got thrown out. My, my comic book collection, I could I could be retiring on the interest that w- would come from the sale of those things these days. We'll have more with Rick Ackerman right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. Rick, are the woke days for Disney over with a change in leadership? Uh, Disney is really hardcore. You know, uh, I would say getting Disney to go unwoke would be like getting uh, a a, uh, a skinhead to convert to Judaism. You know, it's just not it's not in their DNA. So whatever Disney says, I think they're going to try to protect their woke turf in some way, and uh, it's become habitual with them to have your Rainbow Coalition featured in all of their animated uh, movies and things like that. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not, Dis- Disney, there, there were sins that Disney's committed than wokeness, you know. For one, they really destroyed the, the creative element of, of entertainment, of movies, of whatever, because virtually all the movies they release feel like they were scripted by a, uh, well, some some precursor to AI or, or a focus group or something. So Disney was, uh, you know, when we were growing up, it was a very charming, innovative uh, producer of uh, entertainment, and they've gone totally... Um, anyway, I, I guess you can tell I really hate Disney, but no, I don't think they're going to reform. Well, AI's been around a long time. We're only talking about it now because of uh, chat, GBT, I think it's called, because uh, it uh, can voice things. 
But really, autocorrect is AI and, and so on 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 your cell phone. And, and we had an interesting conversation. I recall about self driving cars. He said, "Well, look what autocorrect does when you write something on your phone. It's wrong half the time." What about self-driving cars, Rick? Are, are they a reality now, or could they be a reality? I guess they could at some point. AI at this point is just a lot of hubris. There are all the purveyors of AI, Microsoft, and everybody's getting in the game, Google. Um, they're all trying to uh, claim points for whatever their version of AI is, but it's just a, a lot of hooey at this point. And, yeah, I do think that you better be, you better be careful about letting AI drive your car because it's really the same geniuses who program autocorrect, which is uh, autocorrect operates like uh, a human with an IQ of about 30. So, um, but but the the interesting thing is, you know, you've got some some big guns out there, and some of the futurists, the thinkers, Jaron Jaron Lanier, and uh, even of course Elon Musk and some others saying uh, that that we better be really careful about how AI develops because it could wind up being, you know, when, when uh, Oppenheimer and the boys discovered how to make the bomb, um, that there could be uh, in more evolved forms of AI some things that could be harmful to civilization as a whole. But um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's sort of progressing, but they've got a, a, a yellow flag out on AI right now. And um, and I guess we're all sort of fixated on all the neat little tricks that it can do, but uh, it, it can't do much. And the Hollywood the Hollywood strike now is is particularly interesting because the the writers and the actors are now together striking, and the the main point of it is well, are we all going to be replaced by AI? And um, and if you needed any reassurance. That uh, or, or assurance that they will be replaced, and that's the intention of Hollywood. When I speak of Hollywood, I'm, I'm talking about the big time producers. Uh, they'd love to do away with talent, and and you can already make a movie. You can take clips. You can essentially assemble, reassemble Gene Kelly and make a Gene Kelly movie uh, with Gene featured at any age of his life, doing whatever you want him to do, uh, and and you know the current crop of actors mm -hmm. they could market their they could license their image uh for movies so you can make movies now without the actual stars so so barry diller was out there the other day he's a zillionaire uh content producer and and he was saying something that you know you can just sort of that bell should be going off in the uh, heads of the actors and the writers because what what diller said was oh you know, it's just a lot of fuss about nothing. You know, the, 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 we're, we're not going to use AI to do away with all the, uh, the creative talent. It's just going to give them some help. It's going to make it more efficient, make it easier for them to do what they do. So, so if you wanted any reassurance that Hollywood is about, it, it's fixing to stop its heel on all this creative talent, you just have to look at Barry Diller's statement and read, read between the lines. Uh, my wife is uh, one of the executives in the Crime Writers of Canada, and uh, one of the authors said her publisher wanted her to sign a contract that allowed them to write books in her style without her permission, and she would get no royalties from those books. She turned that contract down, but the publisher says, without it, we're not going to publish your book. They, they've put these people in a very hard place. See, she's got an antitrust action there. Um, not, not that it would, in the U.S., it would be a tough sale to bring that up to the level of the Supreme Court. But if that ain't antitrust, really, uh, I don't know what is. Well, yeah, in Canada, we, we don't have RICO laws. It's not illegal to belong to an organized crime organization for some reason. It's, so, it's perfectly legal in Canada. I think they're called political parties. But, Right. That's, yeah. that's right. <laughs> uh, Rick, so, uh, now what, what's going on with uh, things like gold? Are, are people still uh, looking at that as a way to preserve wealth or uh, are they still going after Bitcoin for the big for the big uh, home run? Well, I kind of wonder myself whether all these yo-yos who 
few years ago with uh, Bitcoin upwards of 50,000 who were saying, oh, yeah, I'll trade my gold for Bitcoin anytime. But uh, anybody interested in taking the other side of that trade is going to, I think, make out pretty well. Um, gold, gold. Uh, whenever gold looks interesting, exciting, even for a few days, I always want to double check myself you know um it's had a pretty good rally off a low in the end of june from around 1900 we're at 1990 but we all know that the takedowns could could neutralize that whole rally in 15 minutes um so gold it's acting bullish and it, it is in a long-term bull market but it's just not in any great hurry to um to, to really take off, in other words, to get above 2000 and to just stay there. So it traded as high as 1990 today. It's flirting with the 2000. Uh, it's not so much a barrier anymore. It's just kind of a, a psychological, it's, it's, a, it's a benchmark. So, uh, so I don't know. I, I have, I'm always skeptical that this is, this is the one gold has begun its move, uh, in part because I think that, that it's, it's going to do that in its own good time, but based on something that has changed uh, in the big picture, you know, and it's possible that gold will lead that change, and gold will take off, and then we'll discover why it's done what it's done uh, somewhat later. Uh, hold on, I'm sort of playing with a gold chart here to give you a, a target uh, for the next move. It's It's definitely in a pattern, that will take it from the current 1969 to 2154. So that's that's the the big number in gold, and and I, I would say there's you know every chance it's going to get there. The key resistance is 2027. That's based on the August Comex contract. So I think it's on its way up to 2154, uh, which is not a not a huge move, but it, it certainly puts gold. In, in territory where the firmness of, of the bull market is a little more convincing. Well, at New Year's, uh, gold was worth uh, eighteen twenty six. So it, you know you've gained a thousand bucks if you bought then. Um, eighteen twenty six. Uh, you've gained some. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, but gold actually today was trading. Where it's made no net gain yeah. since the uh, beginning of 2022. Wow. You know, it was trading where, where it was now early in the first quarter of uh, 2022. So it went a little bit above that, went a little bit below it. And it is in okay. basically a bullish pattern that, that I think pretty confidently points to 2154. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then it, it'll, it'll look better. But it could noodle around here for the next six months. Is grain a good place to be with uh, Russians canceling the the uh, grain deal with Ukraine? It's really hard to read the news and and be sort of in or out of grain. Grain it has its own uh, cyclical quirks, and all the everybody who trades it are they're all aware of the news and the situation. So I never really use um i never use a headline really to to decide me on on uh let me take a look here i'm taking uh looking at uh, soybean meal and uh kind of looks like gold you know it is in a pretty bullish f uh, formation here that projects uh, way above uh oh, 53 five five dollars and 30 cents of, of, of soybean meal not even sure how they measure that but uh it looks pretty good but i'm not sure i would uh jump into the market based on some immediate supply situation what's going on with crude uh crude has been really squirrely and uh, uh it is also in a bullish formation that could it, it, it points to over a hundred dollars a barrel, but I have my doubts that it's going to get there. There are that's the big pattern, but eventually the little, the smaller pattern may prevail. But we had a, a big move uh, beginning and just before 2021 uh, that took crude from forty dollars a barrel up to close to a hundred, 
And that hundred was in, in April, May, I think June of 2022. And since then, it's just been selling off, looking like it's consolidating for another big move up. But if you were waiting for that move and kind of taking tentative positions all the way down, uh, you would have been stopped out 10 times, really. So it keeps keeps making uh, lower lows. It hasn't made a, on the daily chart a significantly higher high in a long time, not since uh, July of last year. So, uh, so I, I don't know. It's, um, it, it's obviously a creature of, uh, of global cartel manipulation, but there are factors of supply and demand and, and it's, it's hard to get a bull market in crude going unless there's a demand side story, which, uh, which, uh, typically would center on a, robust improvement in China's manufacturing economy. They're the, they are the marginal pricer of crude, and we don't hear any such stories coming out of China. Uh, with China, the state of their economy, I saw an article where Chinese who used to buy milk products, fresh milk, liquid milk, they're uh, now poor and have to buy powdered milk for their kids. Wow. I mean, it's, it's like just a small step away to putting water on your cornflakes. Well, in taste, but uh, nutrition-wise, I, I went to an Indian Affairs school when I was a little kid, and they had that powdered uh, milk for them, and also protein biscuits, the two of the most gross things you'll ever put in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and did, did you dip the biscuit into your powdered milk? <laughs> it didn't help. It didn't help. <laughs> It was still like trying to to chew on a roofing tile. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that's awful. I hope we never never comes to that. Like uh, water, powdered milk on my cornflakes, and protein biscuits, which are like dog biscuits. Uh huh. O- only they look like crackers. Uh, Rick, any other sector we should be keeping a close eye on right now? No, I uh, I noticed that in my chat room, someone said that they, a 13 to mark uh, sim, uh, signal had been given, meaning uh, we're within 13 days of a of a it could be an important top in the broad averages. So I'm I'm kind of looking for that. I have my own technical methods, but this one trader is really astute in reading kind of the bigger picture. Um, in fundamental ways psychology to market so so i'm at least on the alert right now for uh, an important top in the stock indexes rick thank you so much for chatting with us oh it's always a pleasure jim i appreciate your inviting me on my guest has been rick ackerman editor of the newsletter rick's picks his website rickackerman.com if you have any questions for Rick or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. We'll ask that question for you. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on howstreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.